Let us all please uh, be reminded that we are before the holy presence of the Lord. Uh, dearest Lord, today we continue to thank you for all of the guidance and blessings you've given us. And we thank you for granting us another opportunity for us to learn together as a community. We hope that we may improve upon the many gifts you've given us, Lord, and that we may better ourselves according to your will. We pray that we, you will continue to watch over us, and especially to those who need your blessing in these trying times, and that we may all move forward safely together as one. We ask this in your most holy name, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Victor. <laughs> and now for what we've all been waiting for, the event proper. But before that, siyempre, ipakilala tayo na yung speaker. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our speaker for DSCCPU's first event entitled Desi uh, Graphic Design from Scratch. Our speaker today is a graduate of BS Information Technology from the University of St. Paul's Iloilo, or St. Paul's University Iloilo. He currently works as a freelance graphic designer and has accumulated around four years of industry experience, during which period he has been featured in Dribble, Noise Magazine, and U Edge Magazine, to name a few. Our speaker is none other than Mr. Edwin Carl Capalia. Oh, so um, I'm live? Okay. Hi, guys. So... Wait, so let just me prepare my slides for a minute and I'll be just, okay. So I'll just share my screen. So hi guys, good afternoon. So Medjo Shaiko, so please bear with me if I stutter or I don't explain something clearly, but I'll try my best. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Do I have sound? Okay, I do have sound. So, but before anything else, I would just like to thank Nicole for inviting me to speak and to also Sir Lawrence since he is the one who referred me to Nicole and also since he was initially the person that was going to speak in front of you guys. And I would just like to thank him since if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. So, I'm not the best graphic designer, but I do like teaching people things about design and I love sharing my passion with other people. So, I hope you guys learn something and enjoy. So just like any good presentation, and before I talk about color theory and the fundamentals of design, I would just like to introduce myself. You can all be familiar with me and know what my credentials are as a designer. So my name is Edwin Carl Capalia. I have been freelancing for four years, started out as a freelancer in college, doing t-shirts and logos for friends. I have studied in St. Paul for six years, okay? And you might be wondering, Six years, grab because ang IT ba? The, but the truth is, kapila ko magritik, and you, and I was very tamad, so don't be like me and stay in school, okay? So this is where my journey in design started, and I'll be explaining more on like more on that later. So as much as I like design, I'm really bad at drawing. All I really know are doodles. So if you can't tell by the arrows I have, so effortlessly drawn those. Those were made by me. Photoshop is my main tool. It didn't start out as that, but I, like as I continued my like creative journey, it became my main software. I have been designing for quite a bit, so I tend to get bored easily. So if I continue to do the same thing over and over again, I try my best to learn new techniques and software. So how did my design journey start? As I said, I was a student in St. Paul. My love for design started in a web design and development class I was taking. The funny thing is I really had no interest in like in going to school or design. So but as like I started to actually fall in love with design on my like sixth, like on my retake of the class. So I was a bit more serious with my second attempt. So I started to pay a bit more attention. This is when I realized like whenever we do, we like we would do sit works or quizzes about creating websites. I, on the, on the other hand, would usually invest more time in making it look cool and nice rather than making the actual site work. So then I looked into the idea of design as a career, and the rest is history. So this was me back then. I was still in college. I was attending a web dev and design competition for Pisits. I was competing against different schools in Region 6, and this is where I realized that their idea of competition didn't meet my expectations. 
what I thought was going to happen, like based from the title of the competition was that we were going to design creative web layouts based on a sort of theme and content they have like would present us. So because it had the title of design, but it turns out we were just like recreating a layout they already had prepared. And of course you can change the colors and add your own flair, but that was boring because what's the point of designing something if you are just going to recreate their work? So that's so that kind of ended my experience with creating websites. And since I also realized that creating websites takes a good amount of time and effort, I was really impatient back then, and I wanted to look for another venture in design. So just after my experience with web design, I started to take interest in logo design. And logo design was very appealing to me, not only that it was easier in designing, for me at least, but the concept of summarizing all of the personalities and traits of a brand into a like mark or symbol was really intriguing to me. Up to the point, I actually then invested in getting books about logo design. This was a big moment for me because I was actually getting books. I don't like to read, but I have started to develop this affinity towards design up to the point I'm actually buying something in order to learn. Okay, but I took six freaking years of one course, so that was crazy to me. By this time, I had that designer gut feeling. It's kind of cheesy, but I kind of knew and I was determined that, oh, this is the thing I was going to do for the rest of my life. Turns out it wasn't. But before that, I wanted to build up a portfolio of logos so that I have some work to show whenever I would graduate from school. So by this time, I was only doing logos and shirts for friends. And it's still a good way to create like a body of work. But I wanted to do something more like real work for actual clients. But I really couldn't since I was still in school. So one day, like the boyfriend of my cousin mentioned that, I see you posting a lot of logos on your Facebook. Maybe you should try this website called 99designs. And I said, well, OK, OK, I look into it. And oh boy, I, did just, I didn't just look into it. I used the website for like two years. So what is 99designs? So the basic concept of it is it's a website where clients can host contests, which any designer can join for the chance of their design getting chosen by the client. And the prize is money. So it's basically a battle royale. The last guy who stands takes the prize. It was a very safe move for the clients who go to the site because for the amount of money they are spending compared to the amount of work they are receiving was twice or three times as that. You can then start to see the problem of the site. The chances of you winning are really small and most of the work that gets submitted is crap. So there are different categories we can, which you can join, but I mostly join logos and branding. And what I would usually do was to wake up and submit as many logos to different contests as I possibly could. And luckily I did win a few contests and for those who are interested, the prize money for logos and branding back then were like usually around $350 to $500. So if I look back at it now, I don't think I could possibly do that again since I start to really get mentally fatigued after a few designs. But going back to the main topic at hand, I was almost at the end of my career with 99designs when I realized that the growth and potential of my designs could be more since what I was doing was submitting logos as much as I could. The quality of the logos I was creating were bad. And also since the chances of you winning are very small, the effort wasn't really worth it. Now I wanted to rest a bit from logo design. And by this time, as I was like a year away from actually graduating and I have always wanted to try Photoshop. Since take note, what I was using to create Logos was Adobe Illustrator, and I had this stupid idea that I said to myself, like, you are not a graphic designer if you don't know Photoshop. It is really bad. Don't think like that. So I wanted to learn Photoshop and didn't have, like, the motivation, and I didn't know where to start. Like, but that changed when I met this guy. So this guy is Bastian Catro. Before I was introduced to him, I was browsing Instagram like I usually do, and I found his work. I really liked it, so I went to click on his profile to find out more. I found out that he was doing this ongoing project called Baugasm. Now, what Baugasm is, it was a project of him creating a poster every day for a year. 
to me, this sounded like a good excuse and motivation to learn Photoshop, and I wanted to do something similar since now I had all uh, like I had a lot of time since I wasn't creating logos. So I wasn't really confident if I could finish it, but I wanted to try it, and I pushed myself to do it. I started my own series called A Poster Every Day, a not a really original name, but overall, it was an awesome experience. I did manage to not only learn Photoshop, but like from continually doing it, I have sort of developed my art style and aesthetic, which I think is really cool. I learned a lot of different techniques from tutorials. I also managed to teach myself a couple of cool things from just messing around with the software. Thankfully, I did finish the series, and these were some of the posters I did. My style was mostly abstract forms and shapes, and that part of me still exists with my current designs. I have always liked the idea of abstract art since different people see different things when you look at it. So sometimes you don't need some meaning behind it, but it just needs to exude that emotion or personality. So one lesson I also learned from doing this series overall, especially if you want to do something long-term like this project, where like you have to create something every day. Motivation is a good way to start, but consistency and discipline is better in the long run. Since, mo like, since motivation fades away very easily, so I think it is better when you're like, planning on doing this style of project. You should like create a schedule or time frame just for design. So you just start to train yourself that during this time frame, you need to create something. So even when you don't feel like designing and the time comes, you already have trained your mind to start creating. So it's especially hard when you have to make up time with your friends and family, but like when you develop that consistency, it becomes easier. Also, one of the good things that came out of this project was that I was well, like I was inter like I was invited to be interviewed and my may have my art be featured in a couple of magazines. My first interview was called was for a magazine called New Edge. It's a magazine on the right. So they also asked me to do the cover, so which I happily complied. So and the next magazine was for Noise. It's the magazine in the middle. Like a compilation of work from different artists around the world. They asked me through Instagram for like permission if they can use some of the posters they did. So of course, if I said yes. The last one was for a magazine called Canto. It's a magazine based in Manila. This was a bit more special since if you don't know the guy in the cover, let me introduce you to Dan Matutina. He's like one of those OG graphic designers I followed. I really liked his illustration style when I was just starting out and I started to follow his work. He's an illustrator for Plus 63, a studio in Manila. He has this geometric and textured style, which I really liked. So I had this awesome opportunity to share the magazine with him. And I like, and I only knew he was going to be like on the cover when the, like when the magazine released. Plus I had the chance to meet him in person like here in Iloilo because of like the Behance convention that was held in like ICC a couple of years back. So after those interviews, I was about to finish my poster series and I had a choice to keep it going or take a rest. I chose the latter. So after resting for a couple of months, I wanted to start another series, but this time I decided to stick with Photoshop, but instead of designing posters, I wanted to create album covers. Since I have always liked music and the idea was very similar to my poster series, so it was an easy switch for me. The title of the new series is, is called Experiment, and based from the title itself, it's just me experimenting and having fun with different styles and techniques. So after creating album covers for quite some time, I got the chance to be interviewed for, like, for Dribble. So aside from Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, I also post my work on Dribble. And if you don't know what Dribble is, it's a global platform where like, interna like international motion graphics, designers, illustrators, developers get to post their work, like where the main audience is mostly designers and clients like startup, media companies, the, the clothing, cars, etc. So. This platform was a bit special because I started posting on the site midway when I started to create logos. So a lot of time has passed since I got the opportunity to be interviewed. And in order to post on Dribble, you need an invite from another designer. So just not anyone can post their work. I got mine from a random stranger who I think found my work on 99designs. So 
So which I was really like really lucky to receive that. So you can get why this was a bit special because I've been always using Dribble, like and being to able to represent like the Filipino designers and get recognized on the platform was very humbling. So these are the types of covers I did for the series. They are mostly abstract and just me messing around. There are really no rules behind it. As you can see, I really like to use faces. I think they are a good medium to experiment and manipulate, and you can get a lot of different results from it. Here are more abstract pieces that mostly focus on form and color. And all of the abstract color illustrations you see here are just made with Photoshop, like with the its default tool sets. So I think that's really powerful that you can create these types of like designs from just one software. So another good thing that came out from this series. So one day, uh, I got an email from a client like through Dribble. They said they liked the designs of the album covers I was uploading and asked if I would be interested in a job for their company. At first, I was like, "Is this a joke? Like, is this a scam?" Since I just don't get job offers from like out of the blue. And after exchanging a couple of emails, I learned that he was an actual person. So he was like the former chief research officer of Ketchup, a mo company who publishes mobile games. So they were known for stack. So if you remember that game where you have like the squares that pass by one another and your objective is to stack them. So that was stack. And 2048, where you have like a chessboard filled with squares with numbers on them, and your objective was So is everything good? OK, so. OK. So OK, so just I was talking, let's just start from the beginning. Another really good thing that came out of the series was well, like one day I got an email from a client through Dribble. They said they left the designs of the album covers I was uploading and if I, like and asked if I would be interested in a job for their company. At first I was like, is this a joke? Like, is this a scam? Since I just don't get job offers out of the blue. And after exchanging a couple of emails, I learned that he was an actual person. He was the former chief research officer at Ketchup, a company who publishes mobile games. So they were known for stack, you know, the, the game where you want to stack pieces of squares and rectangles on top of one another. And 2048, uh, where you have these chessboard filled with numbers and your objective is to add all of them to 2048. And they wanted me to be the sort of illustrator for their marketing team at this new company called Super Happy Fun Time. They also produce mobile games. They were based in Vietnam. So this was a big moment for me since this will be like my first ever job since outside of like freelancing. So after like for thinking for quite some time, I said yes. I was working remotely for them and my responsibilities were to create illustrations about announcements, updates, and upcoming events for the games. The funny thing is, like my job back then was not really far from the thing that I was always doing. I was only like creating one illustration every day and I would submit that to the team to see if they liked it. Since by that time I was kind of neglecting Illustrator since I mostly used Photoshop and because of the job I needed to use Illustrator so I used that as an opportunity to become like more familiar with the software and like and how to create illustrations with Illustrator. So these were the uh, like some of the type of illustrations I did for the company. You can see some of them don't have any relation to games. So it's like some of them are just there to announce holidays or what you're feeling. For example, um, it's summer today. Have you prepare your sunscreen? And I would just like make an illustration for that. Sometimes I would take the assets from other designers and composite them all together, like these poker type illustrations, like, or create them entirely from scratch. So now after a, work, like a year working for them, they asked me if I would like to work in-house for them, like move to Vietnam and work there, but this time mainly focusing on animation. So this was another huge opportunity, and after like thinking for some time, of course, I said yes. So I was excited to learn another genre of design. I traveled there. January of 2019, and the experience was amazing. I got to experience 
like the the culture, the food was delicious. Like I got to meet amazing people. The amount of motorcycles you see are absurd. Yeah. After work, like working for about a month, I decided it was too huge of a leap to migrate, like straight out of graduation. So I like decided to go back home. I was disappointed in myself, and rather, and after like experience, like that experience, I kind of had a short hiatus from designing. So it took a while, but I found myself while I found myself still wanting to pursue my passion in design. So once again, I had opportunities to work with local clients. One of them is Il City, a local streetwear brand here in Iloilo. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Most of these made it as final designs for their shirts. The reason why most of these are typed is because they wanted to see their brand name in like various places. So I tried to read the letters. Speaking of shirts, these for Globe. They were used by the employees during the, like the recent Dinagyang Festival. The brief was to use the classic globe colors and like represent the culture of Dinagyang. I went with a, like a simple geometric illustration since Dinagyang was a public event and the age group of like the people joining the festival ranged from like babies to senior citizens. So I wanted the design to be simple enough yet bold enough so that all age groups could understand it. And based from my experience with like Il City, most people tend to like simpler designs on their shirts, like rather than very complex illustrations. I also had the chance to visit the Globe office, so, and like actually here in Ililo, so that was cool. I also I said also that I like make like I make album covers, so here are a few album covers I did for actual international clients. So the biggest and longest relationship I had with a client was for Anson Zebra. He's one like one of those rising artists. I'm not sure if you heard of them. So who have like accumulated over 160 million streams in under just two years. The first cover I did for him was Robin Hood. It's like the bottom middle piece. And like after that successful release of that song, we continued to work with each other with more projects. Oh yeah, so this is a video. I'm not sure if you can play it, but. So if I haven't mentioned yet, like uh, designing for me was trying a lot of different things. So you see what you like, and, you, if, and if you don't like it, you get a better understanding and appreciation for the medium. So if you stop learning, you get left out. If you stop exploring, you can become stagnant. So since I'm comfortable with Photoshop already and like an Adobe Illustrator too, this time I'm currently exploring a way to animate and best present my album covers. So I'm doing this through 3D learning. This one is one like, this is a video, one of the recent collabs I that high quality since I had to like compress it so it doesn't really get like get squished by the quality of Facebook and other media stuff so that was like one of the things I'm trying to practice now which is 3d animation I also haven't stopped creating logos this one's like for the most this was the most recent project I did this year it's for 10122 a CrossFit brand here in Vilia the reason why they named it 10122 is because those are the coordinates of Ililo. The, like, the silhouette of the person inside the logo took its inspiration from the coordinates in Ililo, which is like 10 degrees north and 122 degrees east. So the arm represents an arrow pointing north, and the leg represents an arrow pointing east. So I was really happy with the outcome of this, since you can see the logo plastered on a big sign outside the building. And, and, and at night, you can see it lit up. It's really bright. So. So that was my journey in design, and I ended up here talking to you guys. Basically, with those experiences comes along side, like with continuous, with continuous learning, some of which I am going to share with you today. So these will be the fundamentals of every designer and developer. So before we actually start, I would just like to point out, like, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Like this just means like I learn better when I'm actually doing something rather than just reading it. 
So most of the design rules or principles we're going to talk about, I've learned most through like feeling and like by continuously practicing. And obviously I started with tutorials and reading, but as I continued with designing, I have sort of developed this subconscious, you would say, like of design, you would say. So I will try my best to explain everything and it was also really refreshing that I was like able to relearn the things I've learned while making these slides. So we're going to start off like with color theory, color theory, and basically what this means is that how colors mix, match, or contrast with each other, and depending how we mix and match these like certain colors, we can affect how our design can feel. It can affect the color, the message, and how the viewer perceives it. And because the colors are the first things that a viewer sees, it's important that we get to understand this principle. So color theory starts off with this circle right here, and it is called the color wheel. This was invented by Sir Isaac Newton in 1666. Oh, 1666, while he was researching like the white light bouncing off like prisms. He noticed that the light reflected created a spectrum of colors, and he believed that the colors shared a harmonious relationship. Now, before I talk about the basic color schemes we can create with the color wheel, and now we can apply that to our designs. What are the parts that make up the color wheel and what was this harmonious relationship Sir Isaac Newton talked about? So the color wheel consists of three groups. The first one is primary colors, which is red, blue, and yellow. And the sort of idea or relationship behind these colors is that with just these three colors, you can create the whole spectrum of colors. So let's take a look at the second group which is called the secondary colors, which consists of orange, green, and purple. If you remember our previous slide, I said that <clears throat> with just the, like, the primary colors, we can get the whole spectrum of colors. So if we took red and blue and mix that, we can get purple. If we mix red and yellow, we get orange. And lastly, if we mix blue and yellow, we get green. So now that we have our primary colors and our secondary colors, we can mix those two groups together to get our third group, which is called the tertiary colors. So for example, if we mix blue and green, we mix blue-green. If we mix red and violet, we get red-violet. So with just those three primary colors, we have managed to create the whole color wheel. Also, a little fun thing you can do with the color wheel, if you sweat it vertically, the colors you see on the left are, are called warm colors. And on the other hand, the right is considered cool colors. Each side has its own unique personality. For example, warm colors are generally associated like energy, brightness, action, whereas cool colors are often identified with calm, peace, and serenity. So you can use this next time when you are designing and you're like, if you're having a hard time getting a certain message across. So these are just sample following, like, like what uh, warm colors are and how these represent the personalities I just mentioned. So now that we've talked about how the color wheel is made, now how can we use it and which, like know which colors to use in our design? So first of all, there are various color schemes, like with the color wheel, but what I'll be discussing are just the basics. So, and I'll show you some examples after each color scheme. So the first color scheme we have is called <clears throat> the complementary colors. So these are the colors that sit across from one another in the color wheel. The colors like green and red, blue and orange, yellow and purple. And these colors create maximum contrast. And take note of that since they can really make your design pop and can be very attention grabbing and create that distinction between each element. But sometimes these colors can be a bit too overwhelming in designs. So to counteract this, you can try like lessening the brightness of the colors. So here are just some examples of complementary colors. This was done by uh, this was done for like Maybelline New York. So as you can see, they use purple and yellow, and I like how they used yellow in the background and just added the pop of purple to really create that silhouette like of the product. It wasn't part of the team that created this, but maybe one of the reasons why they chose to stack the product by doing the pieces is that since New York is a concrete jungle of the city, maybe the tall skyscrapers. So maybe they wanted to represent that through like the arrangement. So this is another piece that I found look rather interesting. It's very experimental and abstract. 
but you can see how the, the photographer used the color of the wardrobe and the mirror to get the blues from the sky, it's hot, like with one another, and just to overall add a touch to the scene. One thing I also said earlier that complementary colors can be a bit too overwhelming. That is why we can lower down the brightness and saturation of the colors. In this example, the designer is trying to show off their typeface by using green and pink. And pink's just like the lighter version of red, so we're still using like complementary colors. Pastel use colors really emphasize the like the light and sophisticated forms of the letters. It makes the typeface feel cream. So just another example of complementary color, which is with a like with a more well-known brand. The next color scheme we have is called analogous colors. These are the colors that sit next, are like sitting next to each other on the color. This color scheme creates a very pleasing and sense of uniformity in your design, so almost like a gradient. But since most of the colors sit beside each other on the color wheel, some designs they lack contrast. So to remedy, we try adding colors like black, white. We need to practice with like the shape, silhouette, and distribution of the colors, and like in your overall composition, just to avoid making your design like blend in with the background. As you can see, the designer like use, is, like as you can see, the analogous colors really give the illustration that uniformity and sense of relay between each color. And this design is a good example of things that we talked about. For example, like I like the decision of the designer on how they chose candy-like pinks, purples, and blues to complement like the soft and round illustration style. You can also see the design like adding in neutral colors such as black and cream to give the illustration more contrast, and as a visual counterweight like to the surrounding objects. I also like their decision here of like adding a horizontal line like in the bottom. So I like how it intersects like with the phone case like, to the front, like from the background, making the design less static. Here's another example. This time is for International Women's Day. And again, we have that sense of uniformity and like addition of colors to add contrast. I overlaw all like the composition of this one, which they added like more blue from the sky. We like and add that to behind white side of that. Since it kind of hurts the eyes, it's lost with the background, but that's just like my critique. And this example, you see greens, yellows, limes. Once you can, like, once again, addition of blacks, which is very common in this type of color scheme. I like how they did lighting in this space. Oh, wait, wait, let me fix my audio. It's just a second. So, so let me just mute myself. I'll just fix the audio. Wait. So, is it better now? I'm just gonna say a sentence. Uh, let's see if it's if it gets better. Okay, so I'm gonna. So, so let's see again. So we have this. You, I like how they did the lighting in this piece, particularly the backlight, creating that very soft and radial gradient behind the subject. Uh, wait, let me see my mic. So I'm sorry for the like the delays. Wait, let me open the settings. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. So I just like, like I said, there's this soft radial gradient behind the subject, creating that really good separation from the background and foreground. But like it, it's also used to like to emphasize the face. Also, Instagram uses this color scheme. I'm just wanting to point that out. Lastly, we have triadic colors. Now, these are the colors that are equally spaced around the color wheel. This color scheme is for me while achieving contrast. But similarly, with complementary colors, the contrast is overwhelming. So you are free to use more subdued versions of the color. It is also recommended when using the color scheme, you might want to try. Okay, so I'm getting a sig. So, so I'm getting something that says my mic is getting warped. So I'll try to switch my mic and see if that works. So I have two mics at the moment. 
So let's see. Hello, hello, mic test, mic test. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Is this better? Hello? I'm not sure if this is better, but. Okay, so I so I'm getting the signal that this is the, like the main microphone right now is better. So, so lastly we have triadic color. So now these are the colors that equally spaced around the color wheel. This color scheme is good for creating harmony while achieving contrast. But similarly with complementary colors, the contrast of these colors might become overwhelming. So you are free to use like more subdued versions of the color. It is also recommended like when using the color scheme, you might want to use the one color as the primary color while others are supporting colors. The two most basic triadic color schemes are primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. And the second one is orange, purple, and green. But these aren't the only possible triads because of the color wheel encompasses a wide variety of colors. You can try to create triadic color schemes using the in-betweens from the ones I just mentioned. So this example shows the color scheme using red, blue, and yellow. I like how they presented these brochures. You can see how they use the grid on the left to reinforce the geometric shapes with the, like the illustration style. And like adding circles softens the overall piece and makes avoids it making it look too sharp. And of course, we have the addition of neutral colors to provide that pop of contrast. You can see even see their use of the color red. So aside from the colors of the people's skin, they also used it twice on the shapes. And not and not to and not on the brochure itself, since I they didn't want the whole piece to feel too overwhelming, since red is very vibrant. And this is what I said about using one color as the primary color and using the other two as supporting colors. So I wanted to find another example of a designer using a different triadic color scheme, since most of the examples I found were using red, blue, and yellow. And this was like the closest thing I can find. So we have purple, green, and yellow. So the example shows the designer using a more subdued version of the color palette. The overall effect has this nice professional feel while the other, like while the colors are warm and friendly. Especially that pop of orange really like wraps everything together. So again, we see the usage of red, blue, and yellow. What I like about this photograph is that we have this horizontal line separating like the picture into two equal parts. I mean, three silhouettes, like kind of slowly moving into the background, creating that depth and breaking that horizontal line. And triadic colors for the Frito Lay website. So, just another real life example. So, those are the basic color schemes. So, we have complementary colors if you plan on making your design pop, contrast, but only using two colors, which is good since you save on ink. And that colors if you design on Making it have that uniformity and making it look more dramatic. Finally, we have triadic if you want to achieve harmony of colors, like similar. Also, so now we can move on to typography. And typography is basically how you arrange letters, sentences, and blocks of information in a visually pleasing way. This is font style, appearance, or just the structure itself. And depending on how you see certain elements, you can elicit different types of emotions and messages. So since you'll be talking about type, let's start off with what are like the two most basic types of fonts you will see with typefaces. Firstly, we have sans serifs. These are the typefaces that lack serifs, or a small line attached to the end of the letter. They use simple clean lines and like the same with throughout. The clay and press lines of sans serifs are the main reason why some designers Boy band, which was formed 1998 in what FL? Oh no, my Google chat has recorded my voice. So this was a blooper. Okay, let me go back to my mic. This was embarrassing. Okay, stop it. Okay, let's go back to my mic. That was dumb. Okay, there's a lot of errors in this example. Okay, we're back. We're back. Nothing happened. Okay. So these are the types of serifs or small slide serifs that attach to the letter. <coughs> oh, where was I? Okay, so sans serifs are also 
more legible at smaller p like smaller sizes compared to Ceres. Sans Ceres is also like font give a feeling of being casual, informal, friendly, and very approachable. You can see this typeface be, like being used by companies like Facebook, LinkedIn, Adidas, Nike, and so many more. One of the most famous typefaces is called Gotham, created by Tobias Frere Jones. It was used in the campaign of like Barack Obama. It was like the symbol of change and a symbol of America since the typeface itself was like actually inspired by like American signage. So secondly, we have Serap typefaces. These have a small line or stroke regularly attached to the end of a larger stroke in a, like a letter or a symbol. And these Serap typefaces dates all the way back to like the 18th century when like stone masons would carve letters into rock. So today we see a lot of serif fonts in traditional mediums such as newspapers, magazines, and books. Well, that's why serif typefaces are typically seen as more classical, refined, and are used by companies who want to exude these traits. And these usually makes them a good fit for companies who want to appear more reputable, established, and serious. Companies like Vogue, um, Honda, Sony, Coach, Rolex, and many more. So another famous example of a serif type is Adobe Garamon Pro by Robert Slimbach. We, here we have the designer Dave Egger, who is famous for only using Garamon 3 in his, call, like in his magazine called Maxweenies. So the foundation of typography and graphic design is grids. And grids are all about alignment. So we use grids as a system to anchor elements with one another on the page. And this creates a mix of uniformity and variety, which helps us achieve the structured and ordered typography. I'm sure some of you may be imagining these grid grids are these complex structures of dense rows, like, like dense rows and columns, similar to like graphing paper, which you had in math class, but it doesn't need to be that way. And we, and we can tone it down. And the principle of grids is basically how you align this, like this element with this other element and there are various ways of creating grids. Some people just like to divide their canvas into like equal parts. Some people get more technical and use math. And you can do that. But like what I like to do is use the like the design itself to dictate where on the page am I going to place another piece of text or logo. So for example, I found this piece online and just by like looking at it you already get this feeling of structure and order. If I turn on the grid, you can see how like the designer is using just like the vertical height of the type to dictate where the type on the right is going to be placed. And this is what I was talking about, like anchoring certain elements. Grids don't have to be complicated. And like just by using the height of the type on the left, you already have created a system onto which you're, where you are going to place the type on the right. So this is another example. And once again, just from looking at it, you get the sense of order and structure behind the design. At first, the design looks very like, complicated, but once you see the grid, it's actually very simple. It's so like, so with just these seven equally spaced vertical lines, you can see how they are anchoring the columns on the page and are achieving something that looks complex, but also has variety. Another example, but this time it's for a website. The design has this asymmetry going on. The elements on the page are not equally distributed and the grids don't always need to be equally spaced. So it can be a bit more dynamic and more free without you place it. So in this example, if you look at the grid, so you can see the designer first separating the website vertically into two equal parts. Just by that, it already has this space onto which where to place the type on the right. Now, if you turn like the, on the grids on the left, you can see how the design uses the vertical lines to align the menu items at the top with the information at the bottom. So very simple, nothing complicated. So now if you look at the right side, same situation. The grid is very simple. The designer is, used, is more free with the placement, but he uses the vertical lines anchoring the two columns and is using the same thing again with our first example, like he's using the height of the type like of, of the paragraphs and, sen and sentences to align the second column. So that is basically what grids are. 
you don't always need to have a complicated grid system, but try to practice like whenever you are designing, to always have that like the elements on your page anchor with one another. So now we are going to talk about alignment. This is still part of typography, and this is the core of how we place and organize elements on the page. And each form of alignment has its own certain vibe to it. So, so we have four kinds of alignment, centered, justified, flush left, flush right. The first alignment is centered. This is where your type is centered on the page. This is very formal, static, and symmetrical. But some designers say it's boring because of that. So you can try mixing in typeface with different weights, different typefaces itself, or make some letters be italic, or just make it a bit just like so, make it make it a bit more dynamic. So this is just a series of posters showing you how to create like how center tide looks. It is very stable and symmetrical. The colors and illustration really helps the design add more energy to it and makes the design look less boring. In this example, we see center type be more experimental. You can see the designer playing around with spacing and especially with the solid and stroke form of the letters, not only giving it contrast, but also create two kinds of sentences from only using one. So here is another example of a website on mobile. The design studio tried to add energy to the static layout by mixing in different colors, typefaces, using underlines as emphasis, shapes, colors. Next, we have justified. It's where you are forcing your type to touch both edges of the margin. Because of this, it's very economical and creates a very solid block of text. You can see this mostly on newspapers where space for information is needed. As you can see, this re really creates a nice block of text. It saves on space, but be careful because when you are using this, because the alignment creates gaps or like empty gaps in your type, which are called rivers, so this is a more example, obvious example of a river. You can see how it slices through the paragraph like a river. So to avoid this, you really need to practice your copywriting skills. And so you can try to mix in words that are long with words that are short to fill in, like, fill in the gaps. So next we have flush left. So this is a very organic typesetting. This is where we align the text to the left margin. We have this hard edge on the left and this soft edge on the right. This is the good thing about this alignment is that we avoid getting rivers because the words are equally spaced. So this is like another example of flush left. So I don't really have anything particular to say about design other than that. I like how the designer added like indentations like to the headers just to make it a bit more dynamic. So if you remember, like I mentioned that in flush left, there is a hard edge and there is a soft edge. So if you look at like, for example, at the soft edge, of like the middle right paragraph, middle right, like a soft edge, how the shape of the soft edge almost has this zigzag pattern. So one of the things you wanna avoid when doing flush left is an ugly rag. So this refers to the uneven margin of the soft edge. So you want to avoid rag shapes like stairs, a belly, a crest, like an ulbo, a crescent moon, a solod. Or it looks slanted, so you need to practice and make it look natural, soft, and random. So what you want to have is a sort of in and out zigzag shape, but we also make sure to note about the spacing of your rag and make sure it's tight and not loose. So next we have flush right. It is the opposite of flush left. It is where we have the third, like the hard edge on the right and the soft edge on the left. This type of alignment is unusual and it makes your design more dynamic. Similarly with flush left, you also need to watch out for the rag and make it look natural. In this design, in this design the designer has this very strong and dynamic layout. You can see him using the flush right on the header and to not make the design too heavy on the right, he used flush left at the bottom to contrast the soft edge the header is creating. Also with flush right, there are things to avoid, but this one is very straightforward. So when using flush right, just make sure the hard edge doesn't have too many punctuations like dashes, parentheses, commas, periods, and etc. since it like weakens the edge. So now we can move on to fundamentals of design. So as the great Massimo Vanielli once said, so if you can design one thing, you can design everything. So when he said these words, he meant that 
the fundamental principles of design is the same across all forms of visual communication. And if you are able to master these basics, you can create a design that is timeless. So design is a utilitarian art, which just means your design needs to have purpose and function in mind, but also keeps in visually pleasing. And no one, and one of the ways to fulfill its purpose, it needs to capture attention. And one of the most effective ways to capture someone's attention is through contrast. So contrast is the different, like, it's the difference between two objects. The greater the difference, the more they stand out. If used properly, it can create focal points, hierarchy, and separate objects. There are many ways to use contrast, but we are going to see some examples on how other designers use it. So this is like this example is using color to achieve contrast. And if you remember what they talked about in color theory, you can see how this, like this branding agency is using blue and orange, which are complementary colors. Those are the colors you can find on the opposite side of the color wheel. And we use these colors to achieve contrast. And you can clearly see the separation between each object. So this is just an awesome to see because these are the fundamentals that are still being practiced by like professional studios. And this example, we're going to look how to create contrast with typography. You can achieve this by using different font combinations. A good rule to have is that polar opposites attract. So a combination of a sans serif with a serif typeface is pretty safe. And these two work really well in contrasting sizes. You can try to experiment with changes in weight, spacing, all caps, and so on. In this example, you can see how the header transposition uses a bold serif typeface, sans serif typeface, and it's clearly the biggest element on the design, which is being paired up with a smaller serif typeface, which are slowly getting smaller depending on the importance of the sentence. So this example uses scale as a means to achieve contrast. Just be sure when using scale, the difference in sizes are very obvious and noticeable. This poster, for example, uses the difference in scale to create a story and focal point for the design. So you can instantly tell from the different sizes of the hyenas, the ones that are bleeding off the page are in power and far superior compare that to the lone hyena wandering at the bottom, which has this pitiful stance. Also, don't be constrained to the idea that you only need to show the difference between two objects visually, but you can also use it as a way to tell a story. So next we have repetition. Now, it is the repetition of certain elements throughout your design. It can be repetition of color, shapes, font styles, grid systems, images, anything you can think of. If used properly, it can create very interesting designs. This principle is very, like, especially important when it comes to creating a brand, since the repetition of elements creates consistency and unity. Since the principle of familiarity says, the more we become exposed to certain shapes, elements, or messages, the more familiar they become. So this example is from a series of posters from Tama Art University, which their nickname is Tama B. The series contains about 100 designs made, like, made by uh, the students. They were instructed to create a poster incorporating the school's message, which was made by hand. You can see how the designer use, like here uses the repetition of horizontal lines to create a stack of paper. The slight shadow underneath each line creates this depth and sells the effect. They also crop the hand in a smart way to create the feeling of the hand actually grabbing something. This was a series of posters that were for MIT Media Lab created by Michael Beirut. The style of these posters were based on the MIT Lab logo. So they didn't just create these posters with no basis in mind. There was a starting point and they carried that throughout the brand system. You can see how the repetition of shapes and style of the, po like the posters creates this consistency for the brand. So this is another example showing the posters for the Museum of Modern Art. You can see how they have created this grid system to create this consistent style throughout their brand. This type of grid system is important for providing instructions to different designers that may handle the designing of these posters. So there will be like no inconsistencies with this brand. Next is tension. It is the, e like, it is the unease or suspense before a culminating event, almost like a release. You can see tension in horror films or you're watching, you know, like as you are watching horror films, you notice like the music slowly getting louder and the tempo becoming faster or in action scenes where you have two or your like main characters 
pointing their guns at each other, waiting for each other who will pull the trigger first. So in design, we can use tension to create visual interest to a composition. So if used correctly, it can captivate the viewer's attention, making them feel something is about to happen. So in this example, you can see how your eyes just gravitate towards this fragile piece of band of paper, creating this focal point. And you are wondering how, how is this piece of paper supporting the weight of this rock? And you feel this invisible tension behind the design. Same goes with this design. By covering half of the face of Barack Obama, you are wondering why, what is behind the page, or more importantly, what is the fold hiding? And this creates tension. Another famous example is the Jaws poster. You get the sense of imminent threat to the swimmer, of foreboding of something bad is going to happen. Also, just like other principles of design, don't just be constrained to making your design have suspense in order to have attention. You can also try arranging all of your elements to the center of the page so all of the tension is there. Or you can do the opposite and arrange all of your elements outside of the page, like to the borders. Or you can say it's something so big that it bleeds off the page. So just be careful not to overdo this principle it's like as it gets very tiring for the viewer. So now we have hierarchy. So it is the arrangement of graphical elements based on their importance. So in order to create visual hierarchy, you need to make sure that certain visual elements stands out more compared to other design elements or content. That is why this principle tends to overlap with one or two other design principles like contrast or scale because the manipulations you use to make things stand out are the same manipulations you use to create visual hierarchy. So good hierarchy leads you through design. They allow the viewer to consume the information they presented to them in a chronological order. That is why before designing, it is best to, like, best to be familiar first with the content. And there are many ways of achieving con like hierarchy, and we are going to look at each one. So first, we have hierarchy by position. In the West, they read from left to right. And according to studies, there are two dominant reading patterns, the Z pattern and the F pattern. It is said that after reading, our eyes tend to land on the upper left section of the page. Because of that, it is only logical to place logos of websites on the top left or the information of your business cards on the left side. Second is we have hierarchy by leading lines. It is where you use shapes, arrows, lines, color, text to direct the viewer's attention to the design's focal point. On the left side, you can see how the design is using a more obvious approach to this like this principle by using the road to connect the background to the foreground. They're using it as a way to drive the viewer's attention to not only the car, but also the information with the poster as well. On the other hand, if you look at the post, like an example on the right, you can see the designer using repetition to create leading lines to create a hallway and focal point for your design. You can also use unusual cropping to direct the viewer's attention through your design. The design on the left has this person stepping out of a platform and creates this invisible yet physical space where he came out of. The design on the right crops the letter A in such a weird way, you can't help but look at it. The supporting paragraphs also kind of continues the missing shape of the letter A. So third is we have hierarchy by space. In design, what is invisible is just as important as something visible. Space is, is like essential for organizing and arranging elements in an orderly manner. A good rule about space is that the more space there is surrounding an object, the more you are able to notice it. So if you look at the example on the left, you can see how tiny the subject of the photograph is. But like by surrounding him or her with this huge amount of space, you have created this focal point in hierarchy. The example on the right is more fun. So this one is like this was an ad for Pokari Sweat, a sort of health drink. So they used the logo itself as the, not only a leading line, like towards the runner, but also used as a representation of a finish line. And when you combine that with the white space surrounding like the, the runner, your eyes just gravitates towards her. Fourth, we have hierarchy by alignment. So Alignment, as we talked about, creates order by anchoring each element on the page. In this example, the designer was very creative and misaligned one column of the grid. 
because of that, the specific column stands out even more. So fifth, we have hierarchy by the rule of thirds. This is mostly used in photography, but it can also be used in design. The basic principle behind this idea is that depending on the size of your canvas, you want to separate that into nine equal squares or rectangles. Now, wherever these lines intersect, this will be called, uh, called your points of interest. And what you want is to place the most important object in your design on these points. So using the points of interest will make your design more dynamic rather than just placing it in the dead center of your page. So last, we have hierarchy by scale. This, is very, this one is very straightforward. The bigger the object is, the greater its importance. Now, are we are done with hierarchy, the next principle is balance. In design, it means the equal distribution of elements within your page. So you can achieve balance through object placement, scale, and spacing. Today, we're going to talk about the two types of balance, which is symmetrical, the example on the left, and asymmetrical, the example on the right. So symmetrical balance is when the distribution of elements are equal on all sides of the page. In this example, although the elements on the left and right sides of the design are different, the size and distribution of these elements are equal. Although pleasing to the eye, symmetrical balance can sometimes be known as boring. On the other hand, asymmetrical balance looks less flat and more dynamic. So when creating a symmetrical design and one side becomes too heavy, try adding smaller elements on the opposite side to counteract that. So now, white space is the empty space that surrounds a graphical element. So even though it is called white space, it doesn't need to be white. It just means any area that is free from text, logos, images, and shapes. So why do we need white space? Because it improves readability. Clutter design can be confusing and messy for the viewer, just as it is hard to find an object in a cluttered room. The same goes with design, if you try to find information. Therefore, the more white space we have, the greater the design element will stand out. In this example, we see a dove, a symbol of peace, transferring the letter A from war to the word peace. And the white space surrounding the dove not only acts as the color of the brand, which is the United Nations, but also acts as the color of the sky. Yeah? So you can also see, like, see the use of, again, of the complementary colors, which is blue and orange. So although the design looks very pleasing, you can see the depth and decisions made behind it and how they were like, able to tell the message from switching to from war to peace. <clears throat> so white space can also be aesthetically pleasing if you imagine yourself going into the department store at SM to look for like clothes. You'll notice that it's cluttered and you will see hundreds of clothes hanging from the racks. But on the other hand, if you look at high-end shops like Gucci or Chanel, they have very few options to pick from. So this creates a feeling of luxury and exclusivity. That theory holds true with design. The less cluttered it looks, the more premium it feels. In other words, less is more. And so the last principle is scale. It is the relationship between the size of the elements. So it is not the same with size. Scale is relative. So scale is the relationship between two or more design elements or the relationship between the design elements and the format. So scale helps you emphasize certain elements by showing their importance. If we look at this example, when all of the elements like typography and images are the same size, it will look flat and lack subs like substance. There will be no hierarchy, focal point, or contrast. Scale can also be used to create hierarchy by setting up a focal point in your design. You can, create, you can see in this example, the stairs are slowly getting smaller, creating a leading line for your eyes to follow. So, so to wrap things up, color theory is the science and art of using color. It explains how humans perceive color and the visual effects of how colors mix or mix, match, or contrast with one another. Typography is the art and technique of arranging type to make writ Make written language legible, readable, and appealing when displayed. So these two things make up a huge part of the fundamentals of design. 
which is the same across all forms of communication. And if you are able to master these basics, you can create design that is timeless. So that was my talk. I hope you guys enjoy, enjoyed and learned a couple of things. I would like to leave you with an, like, an assignment as a way to practice what we have discussed. So initially, I was going to teach you guys some um, simple and cool Photoshop tricks I learned while making art. But that wouldn't really make any sense since, since as, as I all know, all of you have different interests in design. Some may want to pursue what I'm doing. Some may be into web design. Some may want to develop apps. Like, and others may be focusing on branding, photography, or, video, like, or videography. And since I wanted you guys to create something with any medium you are most comfortable with, and I'm sure, and I'm not sure if all of you guys have Photoshop. So, so instead, what I'm asking from you, the audience, is to create anything. Yes, anything. Since what we talked about are just the basics and the fundamentals, it can be applied to all forms of design. So you can choose any medium you want. It can be a painting, a book cover, a poster, album art, a website. So basically anything. But like there are only two rules I want you guys to follow. So since we talked about typography, firstly, I need your design to have at least some sort of typography. It could be just a letter, a word, a whole sentence or a whole novel. Secondly, I want you to pick one color scheme from the color theory and apply that to your design. And of course, you can add neutrals if you want. Like lastly, choose one or more principle from the fundamentals of design. So and that's it, nothing more. So that but my text, that but my color, and that but my fundament like one or more fundamentals of design. So I hope you guys create something special with you will be proud of. So just like enjoy the process and be, don't be too hard on yourself. If you do, like if you don't like what you make, since what I've learned like from continuously doing, like trying new things, is that your taste in design develops so much faster compared to your skills. So I'm saying this because I want more people to design and I want to see that, like being shared more on the internet, so, but I don't want them to get discouraged along the way. So thank you. So, and this is the actual ending for my talk. I am really happy. Like I was able to share my story and passion with all the different people here. So thank you once again. I appreciate all the people who, like, who came to listen. So if you want to follow me and see more of my work, you can find me on these platforms, which is Tribble, Facebook, Instagram, and Behance with this future name. And like uh, once again, thank you. So if if I'm still live, uh, Nicole, help me, save me, please. <laughs> Hi, sir. <laughs> okay. Um. So thank you so much for that. Um, a yeah. lot of people have been chatting. Apparently, it's very informative. I feel the same way. <laughs> And um, with regards to what uh, Sir Edwin said pala kanina, um, his uh, create anything challenge to all of us will also be a mini challenge here at TSC. So feel free to submit the designs that you guys come up with to the DSC email or our Facebook page because around this time next week, we'll be presenting the winners and you guys will have prizes. So there or external motivation to really put in the work to skills. Okay. So once yeah. again, sir, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you, everyone. And now I guess it's time for Q&A. So feel okay. free to either turn on your mics or chat in the chat uh, section <laughs> to ask our speaker a question. So where do I look for these questions? Okay, so some of them might be shy, so I'll start by asking a question. Uh, so I saw some of your work, especially the ones that you featured on your slide. Um, back when okay. you were still starting, what inspired you? Um, like when, like when I was doing the, 
like the album covers or like the posters or like um back when you were doing the one year challenge oh okay so i'm not really so i don't really have a lot of patience when it comes to design so i really like to give myself something to focus on and the poster series was really a good way for that like as a medium for me to express and like pour my soul out so like it really helped me since whatever i usually like and since emotion really helps like it's really a big part of what you feel as a designer and whatever you feel it really usually tends to land on the page so i kind of use that as like a motivation as a way to learn and also like to express myself since i really wanted to learn photoshop and and not just that, but I really want to be more to get better in design. I really, like, really wanted to, like, you know, get to another level with my design. And with different people, like, there's different motivations. So, so that was kind of my motivation. I wanted to be like get recognized, but but I wanted to get recognized through like hard work and talent instead of like shout outs or stuff like that. So I really like really tried and. Really, I don't know. Yeah, really try to practice and really develop my style. So that was kind of like the reason behind it. Much, sir. Um, um, while waiting for more questions from the audience, I think I'll ask another one. Uh, so somebody okay. who wants to ask a question that's kind of shy to ask here. Um, she asked what tips you would have for people we're trying to start with uh start with what i'm sorry you got i know no, it's okay um who are trying to get into photoshop like what tips would you have for photoshop okay. beginners okay well one of the ways is to like to you know with, uh, well the easiest way is to start off with like tutorials you find on youtube right so if you have like but the thing is with tutorials it's very like mundane and just like learning and just so people that information like indirect it's very boring and really like it's not really fun so one of the ways i usually try to do is like for example just try set a small goal for yourself like let's create a banner for like this type of illustration and usually what would happen is like if i want to create this banner for this type of like work uh, or make this certain style of art, what usually happen is, oh, how do I put text on, like, how do I put text with Photoshop? So I just Google that. How do I put text in Photoshop? So by that, by that, you're already learning. So now I learn how to put text. And the next thing you want to do is maybe, oh, how do I put a shadow underneath text? So, and that's like the continuous learning process. So by just setting small, like small pro like projects for yourself and you can also you can learn a lot of things and there's no rush with learning right and that's just like the like the best process is actually just having fun with design so i so my advice to you is like start small like just make something just it doesn't need to be, like, doesn't need to be anything special just start let's start small so because once you start like once you start designing and you like get in the zone you you find it, like you find yourself following this rabbit hole so how do you put text and how, how do you put images? So now how do I like hide images behind text? And so like, that's the process. You, you, like, you, found, you, find, uh, like, you find a roadblock and you find information on how, like, how to solve that. And so you repeat that and you repeat that. And sooner or later, you're going to find yourself being really comfortable with the software. And you start to experiment with like on your own style. And so that's like, that's, uh, that's kind of it. Nice, thank you, sir. Um, does anyone from the audience have any questions? Oh, okay, so there's some. Um, from Ms. Paris Brasilano, we have, do you have any advice on how to be a productive designer, especially in this current pandemic situation? Well, well certainly because of the pandemic, I have like started to learn 3D, as like as if, if you've seen with the animation. So, trying like trying new things and learning new things i didn't do this in the slide but i really tried to really explore like in the past 
So I try to design with code. So I use CSS, like I use programs like um, processing, like you have to code in order like to make art. I use like pixel art, I use, um, uh, so for me to pass the time, I try to learn as much things as I could. And by trying those things, like I realized that it wasn't for me, but like that gave me like the sense of appreciation and understanding for like that, that design. So maybe what you could do is like try to learn things, read books. I already bought, bought another book. <laughs> like I bought some books for my birthday and so on, just like waiting for that. Or you can like watch more series or seminars or just try to start your own mini project and just practice on that. Okay. Do I just move on to another question? Oh, so, so Therese, I hope that answers your question. Like, so just try to like, start your own project and be as productive as you can and just play around with it and have fun. And that was sort of like, that's really like the starting point and like the concept of my design career is that if you have fun while doing it, that's actually the best of both worlds, right? So you enjoy and, and you create. So, so next up, it? sir, we have um, Vince Delphin. <laughs> so he says, okay. hello, sir. With all the design genres and styles, how did you find that specific style which sets you apart from the rest? Oh, uh, um, well, if you like, well, style and aesthetics are really different, right? You can't just find it. And as much as you like, like to have that own certain style you have, you just don't really like force it, right? Your, your style develops through continuous learning and continuous like practice. So, so just like you can try like studying other designers and how they do it and just like mimic their style. And you're also starting like starting to learn with their processes and how they develop their style. And like, yeah, so just try to learn, just try to follow other designers, and of course, don't copy them. But like, like through continuous practice, you can just copy it. That's how you develop your style, your, like your size. Because if you actually ask other designers as well, like, they do, when you ask, that, like, when you ask them that question, they just don't, like, oh, I got mine from this YouTube video. Like, no, no. Like, so th that doesn't really happen. But like, you have to, like, as, according as it sounds, it's just really through like continuously doing it. And I think that's really the scary part when you like, when you're starting out as a designer and you like find this long, like long pathway you're going to follow. And that's really kind of discouraging. So just don't really look like at it, like it in the long run and just try actually, just really mini steps, like small steps, like with design. Since if you look at it like, that in the in like in the, if you look at that big scope, really just like setting yourself up for like failure, right? So just try to really practice and want like like people to do it. And I think practice is the best way to like to develop something. So <clears throat> so thank you, Vince. Oh, I hope that answers this, your question. So. So next question I have is for from Jedro Bien. What's a good way to find your inspiration for your design? So there are, well, for me, there are many ways. You, well, we have the internet. So just from that, we have this source or like numerous sources for information, like this design. One of my ways is Dribble. Um, that is where mostly I like, see international designers like post their work. So it's very interest like very happy to see like what's in what's in now what's the trend like what's cool you get inspiration from this so you just stay in style instagram behance uh, movies posters books books is a lot um animation anime cartoons or uh, anything you can th really think of right so so anything you can really like get inspired by maybe it's your life maybe it's your i don't know your boyfriend your girlfriend or your other people around you. So any information like that really helps. Oh, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Jedro. So the next question is have uh, from John. How do you know when a design is finished, like when doing personal work or experimenting during free time? So 
So it's good to have a brief, like, so before usually your client work, you usually like, Siyempre, you have to talk to them what, what they like, what they want on the design, what they don't like, and what they don't want on the design. And usually building from this brief, you can see like, you already have a set of instructions that you reference when you're about to create a project. So for example, I want to create a project, so the client wanted it to be bold, energetic, gusto yung may tao, gusto yung yung represent ang iliilo. So one of the ways we did that was I represented the idea of using like that, like you know, the person with the arm using the representing north and the leg representing east. So when I'm looking at my design and I have this like brief already developed, and I go back to that, right? So I make a checklist like, does this represent illegal? Okay, so is this bold? Okay, if is this like energetic enough for them? Okay, so if that's if that is checking all of your check boxes, that you can consider your design, right? And sort of like, the more you do this, the more you have like this, like the more you get this like second nature that you already get this feeling if it's finished. So that's kind of it. So, so that answer was from John. So next question is from Helbert. Do you use alternative design software aside from Adobe? So just so, as I said, I've tried a lot. I've tried drawing. That didn't really do. So software, right now, I've tried, I'm doing After Effects. Um, and since I'm, I'm like actually learning 3D, I'm trying to uh, learn Blender, which is free. So it, if you guys learn, want to learn 3D, so use Blender. Illustrator is good. Um, like a processing is like a language code something like a script. Masai, you have to code and it's called processing. I used to do that. Um, web websites, basically most of the tools I use are just Photoshop, Illustrator, and Blender right now and After Effects just for color grading. But right now my next project is I want to use, like I want to learn to use green screen and like use like actual footage and like learn printing and how to print my actual stuff onto CDs and stuff like that. So so those are the softwares I'm trying to do. So next is from Dylan. As a starting traditional and digital artist, is it more advisable to practice art by basing off your imagination or by using from other art? As starting, okay, so you, hmm. I don't know, since like, it doesn't hurt to reference other designers, right? Since you're inspired by them. And you're not really, as long as you're not like actually ripping off the designer, I think it's a good way to learn. Because one of the things I've like learned that if you found it, if like, if you find a designer, especially online, usually ka, if you want to one, muna guro, yung mo lang. Standard art, the like design is not actually gonna match theirs, right? And but like it's a good way for it's a good way for you to learn what their process was when developing that design. So so if you like find like a UI or UX person, like a really famous guy, for example, and like or if you're like a traditional art like a traditional artist like yourself, and you find this painting and you want to see. What was the reason why they did this? Why was the reason why? What was the decision why they made this? So I think that reference is a good, especially when it comes to like actually drawing, like since you are a digital artist, like actually traditional. So references really do big, like really lend a big help. Since you can't just imagine everything, right? You really need help and your references. And even professional artists really like use reference. So it's no shame to use reference. So that was for Dylan. So the next question is from Cedric. Hi, sir. I also do graphic design or UI design as a freelance, and I'm just curious. What's the difference working with internal clients versus local clients? So the first thing is the bit. OK, so I really like this question. So the first thing you want to realize when doing international clients versus local clients, the price is really different. OK, the value for design in the Philippines right now is very drastic from international versus local clients. 
and I, it took a while for me to accept that fact, right? Since I started first with interna international clients and I slowly got local clients, and I slowly realized that my prices for international in, like international clients are not are not acceptable at the moment for local clients since the value for design is really different. Also, local like international clients have like I would say let's say they're more professional, but um, you, it's I know they're more professional in a way that you can talk to them and they understand your decisions behind the design. It's, it's like compared to your like, local clients that I don't know sometimes gets a little 50-50. So and also oh yeah so also since we're talking about writing one of the like if you're ever so all this to all the people here so if you're ever like got the commission to do a certain project like my one big tip is so this is the biggest tip I could ever give always and always 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 get a 50% like deposit whenever you're going to start a, a project so ever I, I started doing this since I was like way back and the times I that saved my like my ass from like having the client like disappear on me or run away even with local clients right you always need to have that 50% like deposit or dapat may ano get may down payment get so so it's mutual trust between the client right they trust you that with this 50% you're going to start with the project and like after you're done and and syempre before you pass on project you get the final 50% and you can like develop your like base it on like milestones but ang importante is and like down payment good <clears throat> oh so i think that's the last question i'm not sure if there's if there's more uh we just have one last question from noel okay uh noel you ready <laughs> Oh, Hello. Okay, okay, okay. I hear you. Okay, I hear you. Sir, I saw sa FB you've been trying 3D rendering. How to get into oh. that? Oh, okay. So, like with any like medium, like tutorials are the best way to start. So once you get like, I mostly use tutorials now as like a way to get like the basics down, like. Paano mag file open, paano mag save, paano mag export, or like how do you add this? So you start off like like tutorials that show you like the interface. So what you like know the interface interface. This is really where you have to be patient. So once you get to know the interface, that is when you want to start start like thinking of projects that are small. But those projects that you think are small actually help you a ton because like <laughs> since you really don't know a lot from the software, right? So so how do I add a cube to my design? So like that. So how do I add a texture to the cube? And so you start off small and you pick this. I, okay. So you start off small and you, and the, all of those like tutorials kind of stack on top of one another. So just create projects small. Start off with like the interface, get to know that, and like slowly get to learn like how to add green screen, how to add footage, how to add, how to render. So, so, so start off with small projects and you have, and that just leads you to a rabbit hole of like how to get, like how to design. So, so will there be any more questions? I think we have one final question from uh, Ms. Paris Rasilanio. Um, I don't think her internet's working very well right now, but uh, she wanted to ask Tani about design pricing. Oh, like how to, like how, to, what's the price for this, third, like how, what's, like how do you want it? Uh, yeah, I think that's what she was going to ask about. Or how, Okay, so how do you price your designs, right? So, uh, there's a more, 
I don't want to give this like advice since it's not really based on evidence. Since like there's, I've read the books that when if you want to like base your if there's a more scientific way of, of like calculating how you want to think like for your pricing on design. So one way would be like to calculate all your expenses versus like the time you spend and like all of that stuff versus and how you're gonna create that final like quote for the client. But what I would do, what I did was like start off small since I, I use trial and error. So at first I would start off with like $200 for a cover, right? And as your time as a designer grows, you're like, you get more and more clients, right? So the value of you yourself is getting higher. So sambaka, tama na kalubo ang 200 because I'm starting to get more projects. I'm, I like, and like the time you spend on more on each project, diba mas dugay? So maybe I'll try 300 and see if they continue. So, so just like that. So I would say trial and error is the best way. And there's really, there's, and that's really the truth, right? So you really need trial and error. You can obviously search it on Google, but different people have different ways of doing it. And my way was like usually through trial and error. You can obviously like calculate all your expenses and like versus how like how much you spend every month. So you you calculate your rate per hour and stuff like that. But that was that's like too much for me since I'm really bad at math. But yeah, you can you can try to like start off small and slowly get your like get higher and higher and higher. And with that, obviously you have to develop your like package. So with two hundred only, I only I, I only started with like an album cover. But with three hundred, obviously you add more perks. Like um, you get two proposals this time. You get like a banner. You get, get like this. Okay, so as you get longer and longer design, you also develop the package you bring. So it's. Para my purpose, man, bla. So with logo comes with mood boards, with research, and that's the whole like idea behind it. So. Anyway, so that's it for our Q and A segment. Thank you so much, sir, <laughs> for answering all the participants' questions, and thank you to everyone who asked.